So we're looking at Milton's Lycidas, uh, which uh, is arguably the best known of Milton's minor poems. I shouldn't say arguably. It is the best known of Milton's minor poems, and that's why I'm going to take two classes on it. Uh, and, but its themes are ones that we've seen already in the Nativity Ode and in Comus, and that is the uh, dominant sense uh, or the importance of Christian liberty. Um, and the idea that the freedom of choice is intrinsic and basic to the human soul. And uh, what we choose is going to align with God's will for us. And so there's a sense of, of freedom uh, which is extraordinary in Milton and uh, is there throughout Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, for that matter, and is the, uh, also at the center of that prose treatise area of Pagitica. Right? So there's a common theme of the significance of freedom for Milton and expressed in various ways in various contexts. It's here in Lycidas as well. And uh, that em strong emphasis on freedom is going to run him somewhat afoul of the group to which he belongs, the Puritans, because the Puritans are by and large Calvinists, and the Calvinists are associated at any rate with um, God's predestination, and therefore to some extent um, God's sovereign choice for us which is associated, as I say, with Calvinism, but um, quite frankly, it is just as strongly presented in Aquinas as it is in Calvin. And so I don't agree with the common sentiment, although it is leveled against Calvinism, that Calvinism emphasizes God's sovereignty and predestination. And uh, it's not true of Catholicism, at least presented by Thomas, seen as, in general, the prime teacher of Roman Catholic theology. So I just don't simply understand the objection. If, if Calvinism is, to my mind, the most consistent uh, and biblical of the Reformation theologians and makes the emphasis here, and it's the same emphasis in Aquinas, uh, why is Calvin attacked for it? In, even by Catholics for that matter. I find it extraordinary. And it is not really a matter of huge dispute in the Reformation. That's not the point on which the, uh, the fight takes place between the reformers and the magisterium of the day. It's not on the matter of predestination and so forth, or the idea of, that of God sovereignly choosing his people, predestining them for a certain outcome. That's not there. It's over the doctrine of the atonement and the nature of the uh, Lord's Supper, the communion, and so forth, over uh, lesser issues as well, like church government and so forth. Those are the primary things, but not really on that. But Milton and, uh, is associated with, as I say, freedom. So he seems to push against the tradition there. It's not. And that means, I, in, from Calvinist to, uh, as I say, the Thomas's position. But I don't think it, they are actually opposed to one another. And I don't think Milton presents them that way. He tries to argue, in fact, that's, we'll, we'll come to that when we look at book three of Paradise Lost, God's defense of his allowing Adam and Eve to sin, which he associates entirely with uh, his nature, which he was created free, and free he must remain till he enslaves himself or enthralls himself. Um, and then, then goes on to talk about predestination and so forth. And, and we'll, we'll come to how Milton in, engages with that here. But the strong emphasis poetically and politically and in terms of publication and in terms of uh, how to act in a free republic, the republican movement is uh, predicated on the importance of 
freedom, human freedom. Not as an absolute. So Milton is no libertarian. Libertarians tend to think there are no conditions on human freedom. It's an absolute, which if true, includes the libertinism as well as an absolute thing that we ought to endorse, in which case there's no way of condemning others' choices if they're simply their choices. So we'll endorse sin as a, a right and so forth. And at that point, we're making a right out of a choice, and that's deeply problematic. And Milton's not going to agree with that for one second. But freedom is very strong in motiv uh, as a motivation in Milton's thought. And what makes it the choice, good or bad, is the motive behind it. The reason why choosing the apple is bad is not because uh, of, the tr of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that fruit, is not because the, the fruit is intrinsically evil, but because it goes against God's will. There's a, like it wasn't a poison fruit. They weren't, uh, the, there, were, there wasn't an, a material called evil within the flesh of the fruit which made it evil. It was it defying God's express command that made it evil. So it was in relation in that sense. So what God wills to exist exists. What he does not wish or will to exist does not. And we will find that this is consistent in Milton's present here, it's in accordance with God's will. That's wherein good and evil are determined. And furthermore, freedom exists in obedience to God's will and evil in contradiction to it. So it's not the choice per se. It's the alignment with God's will that determines that. But freedom is a necessary thing in order for human beings to exhibit their highest use of freedom, which is to choose to love God, right? What's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's an Augustinian theology, emphasis on love. Love determines all things. And the freedom is only free when it obeys the one who gave us this attribute of freedom by virtue of being made in the image of God. So this is, uh, we're going to see this throughout. Uh, this, uh, all of Milton's works, but here in, in Lycidas, we have it in another form, another type of poem. I said that Milton was trying to master all manner of styles. Uh, it is devoted to a friend of Milton's, uh, Edward, what was his name? Just temporarily dropped, lost the Edward is it Young? Edward King, pardon me. I knew it wasn't Edward Young. Uh, who Milton probably knew from Christ College, Cambridge. I'm not quite so sure he was as close to Milton as we might ex suspect. It's an occasion for Milton to write a pastoral elegy. Elegies being another ancient literary form that Milton has not yet written in. And this is an occasion to do so. It's a monody bewailing a learned friend. So it gives him the pretext to engage in writing this style of poem. And we're going to see that Lycidas or Edward King is associated with all manner of things, many of which are probably rather flattering to Edward King. He's not as good and great as, as all this. But Milton is using him as, a, as if he were. And since it's, a, it's an encomium of sorts, he's praising Edward King, it's hardly going to be the case that people are upset that Milton is presenting him uh, in a sort of a eulogy. But he was drowned, Edward King, in August 10th, 1637, uh, when his ship capsized, and uh, planned on entering the clergy, so a life was cut short and a life devoted to God's service at that. So that's the, the pretext for writing on this. Now, the pastoral, as I say, it's a pastoral elegy. I, I've talked about 
the pastoral genre already in relation to Comus to some degree, but also the Nativity Ode. And in general, Milton is writing in this vein because uh, probably from Virgil, in his Aclogs, in his Georgics, he is writing in with the pastoral landscape in mind. Pastoral landscapes are often associated with love poetry. They're also associated with I idyllic models for kingship. So again, Song of Songs is written uh, by Solomon to his bride, but Solomon's not a shepherd, he's a king, but he presents himself as a shepherd writing love lyrics to the shepherdess. The Shumanite woman who, he, who is a nameless, but he loves, he adores her. There's more than uh, simply two individuals falling in love. There's something of the king uh, and his bride, which again, uh, in the early church or often in the church, Song of Songs is theologized and taken as an allegory for the relation of Christ the bridegroom to his church, the bride. And so that's one of the ways in which Song of Songs is received and interpreted is as an allegory. It's very strongly theologized. I think that just overlooks the, the fact that eclogues uh, are often written uh, shepherd to shepherdess love lyrics, which they plainly are in Song of Solomon. And it does have a political dimension. And because of the imagery of bridegroom and bride in the book of Revelation, and, and in the Old Testament for that matter, but very strongly in the book of Revelation, there's an immediate desire to overinterpret it as simply an allegory about the church. And I think you can add that, but first of all, there's the very literal reading that this is just a love poem. Lycidas, on the other hand, is written slightly differently. It's an elegy, as I say. It's memorializing a loved one who is now departed. And this, uh, this form of poetry is popular in the Christian Middle Ages and throughout the early Renaissance. So Milton's great uh, role model in some, sen some sense is Edmund Spencer, who writes a great deal of poems in this vein about shepherds and shepherdesses. That's often the landscape in, uh, in Spencer's poetry. Um, Milton describes Lycidas as a selfless man even though, as I said, he was um, part of the clergy. And this is actually a political statement even in his day because in the Anglican fold, there is still something of the Roman Catholic distinction between the clergy and the laity and a sort of a hierarchy here, it, um, which is, well, again, criticized by the reformers. There's a, a sort of a, a distinction, not just of office, but of kind almost. And uh, Milton's reference to his uh, friend Edward King as selfless to some degree is, is directed at that and probably has Christ in mind who laid aside his glory. Though he was in very nature God, made himself nothing taking the very form of a servant, right? So that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess, etc. right? So the nature, the selfless nature of Christ's sacrifice is also a model for um, Milton's reference to Lycidas, i.e. Edward uh, King. Interpreting it, in other words, taking the pastoral eclog and Christianizing it in a way that you won't find in the pagan pastoral eclogues. That's not a part of it. It's not the selflessness of the shepherd. They bewail his loss, but not what he represents in himself. So through the allegory, the speaker here, whether it's Milton, it's not clear, uh, is accusing God of unjustly punishing this young man uh, whose premature death ends a career that would have been very different than most of the ministers of the crown, who Milton still sees as part of the establishment and are not actually in, acting in the interests of the people. Remember, for Milton, this has a political resonance. Remember, this is written 
uh, what did I say, 19, so the drowning is in 1637. Well, Charles I is still king. Okay, so just historical context. Charles I is still king. This is an attack on the establishment, the religious establishment, the Anglicans of his day, which he still sees as uh, fleecing the flocks. It will be directed at the Roman Catholic Church as well, but not only them. They'll say the Anglicans are more or less uh, guilty of the same thing. They've just brought it under the uh, reign of the English monarch, but nonetheless, it's still episcopacy and a prelacy, and it is not Christ's intended uh, operation for uh, the ministry to do such things. And he's going to go on to attack uh, those, those same ministers as depraved and uh, self-centered and selfish as opposed to Edward King. So there's an ideal here and again. So it begins with Milton bewailing the loss of a selfless man, a Christ-like man, who would have been able to stand against these sorts of ministers. Uh, comments or questions thus far from what I've said? Just preliminary thoughts. Okay. No? All right, well, let me proceed a little bit then. So it begins with the pastoral image of laurels and myrtles. And laurels and myrtles, uh, you can see this right in line one and line two. Yet, yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more ye myrtles brown with ivy, never sear that is ever dried. So it's evergreen. I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. So he's going to take the symbol of the evergreen, the eternal life, and he is going to shatter that and take it forcibly. He's going to break the life from it in the same way that Edward King has lost his life. These uh, symbols of laurel and myrtle are symbols of poetic fame. He knows this as well. So they're not just evergreen, but they are symbols of also a victory or of celebration. The, uh, we, we know it from the Olympic games where they'll wear the, the laurel crown of the victor, but it's also used for the arts at uh, artistic competitions, the tragic uh, theatrical um, events. Um, will the, the winner will be awarded a laurel crown for victory. Likewise, Myrtle. So these are symbols of poetic fame that he uses right at the outset, and, yet, and their berries are not yet ripe, so the poet is not quite ready yet. To some degree, Milton's reflecting him on himself even. In, in the person of Edward King, here is somebody who is not yet, his time has not yet come, and yet he's gone. Maybe he's thinking about his own state. And as we know, from what I said of his biography, that time of not being quite ready is going to be prolonged even longer by the civil war that ensues and the republic that will follow it, where he will serve to the point where he loses his sight. And the fear, to some degree, is I could lose the very thing that I was born for and called to do, just like Edward King. So there's an element of um, self-reflection in this, I think. But as I say, the leaves of the laurels and the myrtles and the fact that they're plucked even for the berries, so before it's even come time, they're not yet ripe, is an analogy for what happened to Edward King. A death, an untimely death. But it's also related to a poetic promise and thereby to some degree reflecting him on himself, as I say. Bitter constraint and sad occasion dear compels me to disturb your season due. For Lysidas is dead, dead ere his prime. Young Lysidas and, Lysidas and hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lysidas? He well knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery bear, unwept and welter 
to the parching wind without the meed of some melodious tear. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well. So now he's going to appeal to the muses. And uh, here he will appeal to the, the elegiac muses. So there are different muses. There are nine muses of memory. One of them is related to the epic. We'll, that's the one we'll be best acquainted with. One is related to history. One is related to elegy. One is related to uh, lyric, poetry, one to music, etc. But goes back to that. He wants to, um, it to be godlike. Because, of course, Christianizing King as he will do and invoking the theme of King as a selfless individual, modeling himself after Christ, is going to mean that the whole trajectory of pastoral poetry is also going to have to be pulled in the Christian direction, just like he did in the Nativity Ode, and just like he did in the Mask poem. Um, I should say something about the uh, the rhyme scheme here. You'll note that the there are it's very irregular verse, verse paragraphs and uh, unrhymed lines. In our, and, and at the outset, uh, ten unrhymed lines, with some exception. There's they're they're interspersed here. So more seer, crude, rude. Year, dear, do. For Lysidas is dead. Uh, not it bring it, it's not in a regular uh, rhyme scheme here at the beginning. It probably expresses the distress of the poet himself. You could argue, and you can see the the length of the lines is also differing here. Something chaotic about the beginning, uh, which reflects the distress of the poet himself. And as I say, in our age, when people lose their way and start stuttering and so forth in poetry or lose a sense of uh, grammatical structure, and it's more like spoken word, spoken word poetry, very popular in our day, it's interrupted thoughts. There's a thought, it's a half form thought, and then another one replaces it and another one replaces it. To some degree, I lecture like this. It's more like spoken. I'm talking to you. It's a lecturing style. It's not a good writing style. But it does adequately express an emotional urgency that's breaking the form and, and, and reaching the audience in the emotional fashion. And the poets of this day will do that. They will, at times, deviate from the metrical norms of, that are expected of the genre even. But they do it purposefully. And it doesn't become the dominant mode of writing, although to some degree you could say that in Dunn, he regularly breaks the classical forms, for which uh, reason others more classically minded uh, can't stand them. Like Ben Johnson said that Dunn deserved to be flogged for what he did with poetic rhyme. I mean, it's a, those are strong feelings from a fellow artist. He deserves flogging. There's a greatness there, but how he's lost the sense of order that a classical, classically trained poet ought to preserve. So yes, by all means, express emotional uh, power, but you have to do it within a certain, within boundaries, and that the boundaries actually allow for that. And Johnson's a great example of that. I talked about that when we when I taught 17th century poetry and looked at Johnson, even on the death of his own children. It's very restrained, and yet the restraint is the very thing that gives it pathos. You can see that he's trying to hold himself back from crying. And the very restraint, which we can see, uh, actually adds to the sense that we have a man who is holding himself together, and we admire the holding himself together. Whereas Mr. Dunn is weeping all over the place, flailing about, showing that he's out of control. Well, Milton begins this poem here that way, but he only does it for a minute, and it's, and it's intentional, and it's for a purpose, and then he'll find his stride. 
Whether we think it's a correct on Milton's part, I just simply note that he is doing it. So it's intentional. As I say, in our day, poetry is written without metrical order, and, and uh, although it often has rhyme in it. And actually, if you think about rap and, and spoken word poetry, it's strongly syncopated, it's heavily, like there's a heavy beat, and very orderly. And it's, it, you can express it through, uh, it's spoken, so of course you can, you can use intonation in your voice and so forth. This is a writ, written poem, meant to be read, but still it's a written poem. It is a little bit different. But anyway, the, but the dominant Lycidas is dead, and dead ere his prime. Young Lycidas and hath not left his peer. Even worse. It's not just that he's dead heir is prime. There is no one quite like him. All the more reason for us to lament this loss. Who would not sing for Lycidas? The answer is everyone because there was no one quite like him. He knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. I'm not sure that Edward King was <laughs> like this. It sounds like Milton projecting himself into the death of Lycidas, i.e. Edward King. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well, that from beneath the seed of Jove doth spring. Begin, and somewhat loudly sweep the string. Hence, with denial vain, that is, get away with pretending it hasn't happened. Just like he did, he began L'Allegro and Il Penseroso with the word hence. He's not saying henceforward, he's saying get away, hence, get off pretending that it hasn't happened. Hence with denial vain and coy excuse. So may some gentle muse with lucky words favor my destined urn. Because he wants to lament him. He thinks it's appropriate to lament him. In, uh, let me finish the paragraph and then I'll give my thought. And as he passes, turn and bid fair peace to be my sable shroud. For we were nursed upon the self same hill fed the same flock by fountain, shade, and rill. In certain countries, when, uh, when death happens and there's a funeral, there's a very public um, demonstration of mourning. I'm thinking in particular in the, of the Islamic world, as I've seen it. There's, there's tearing of garments, there's wailing, like loud wailing, cries, screaming which we never see here, but we see demonstrated there. And I'm told that once that happens, then they go inside and it stops. It's not that they're so overcome that they, they, you know, they go back inside and they carry on in this fashion. It's a, it's a venue for expressing the lament, which is culturally appropriate. In fact, it's expected that you will do this. Milton is effectively throwing himself into that camp here. Don't pretend, hence with denial, vain and coy excuse, that we can continue to be English and act as if nothing terrible has happened. Something awful has happened. Let us bewail it. And against, he's going to some degree against the classical norms here uh, of Johnson, who would advocate restraint and a sort of um, stoic, stoicism at all times, stiff upper lip and all that, which itself can express grief very powerfully, in fact. But that's what he is expressing here. I just thought that was an interesting comment to see how grief is differently expressed and how it is, to our minds, expressing it that way. And then as soon as you go out of that context, going inside, okay, so now we'll just cook the dinner and carry on. Well, then you were just acting. Yes, that's correct. We were acting. We were acting out of the grief we actually felt and expressing it in that context. And then when that context was over, it was, we can move on to the next thing because now it's inappropriate to continue to harbor on about that and to stay in that mode. Whereas when it's not expressed, the question is, are you actually allowing yourself to grief? And I notice in our day, we've moved away from funerals altogether and are in celebrations of life which I find extraordinary and appalling. Don't mean to offend anybody, but it's just like, how, how is this in any way helpful? The person who's gone does not need to be celebrated, 
because they're not there and the people who have lost the loved one need to mourn, so they should be allowed to mourn. Funerals are not for the dead, they're for the living, right? That seems to have been forgotten. Anyway, on with the poem. Comments or questions there, but they were fed by the same flock, fountain, shade, and rill. They were at Cambridge, at uh, Christ College, and it's not particularly hilly, as it says here in the footnotes. It's actually, Cambridge is as flat as a pancake. It's in the Fenlands. But why on the hill? Well, again, it's Mount Helicon, the, where the poets reside and so forth. So he's imagining it there. It's not a, he's not reflecting on what Cambridge looked like. Again, he's idealizing it, and he's associated shepherds and hills and all of the Greco-Roman associations therewith. That's why. So, and this is the problem with, with uh, not recognizing that Milton is using his friend Edward King's death as a vehicle for engaging with the pastoral genre and all the conventions that go with it. But then taking those same conventions and Christianizing them, because again, the, de uh, the death of a man means something very different in the ancient pagan world than it does to a Christian, especially the, the loss and death of a man who is so devoted to Christ that he himself was selfless. It's a very different thing. It's actually a cause of celebration in some ways. But for the time being, the celebration is the flip side of, of experiencing the loss, just like Good Friday is the dark side of the resurrection. Right? So we start with the lament, and then we'll move to the happy celebration of life, because he, he, he lives. Although he die, yet he lives. Anyway, together both, ere the high lawns appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn, We drove a field, and both together heard what time the gray fly winds her sultry horn. Winds her, not winds her, winds her sultry horn, that is, blows it. Battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, oft till the star that rose in evening bright toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel. Meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute, tempered to the oaten flute, Rough satyrs danced and fawns with cloven heel from the sad sound would not be absent long. And old Demotus loved to hear our song. Demotus, uh, a, a name taken for pastoral elegies, uh, a tacit reference to probably one of Milton's tutors. Just like Lycidas is a, a name uh, um, for Edward King, Demotus likewise to a tutor that they shared in common. All sorts of associations here already, and, and this is why this poem has been seen as a, uh, a complex and beautiful poem, perfect, perfect in certain ways. Lots of, of structural patterns and imagery that pulls it together and all sorts of auxiliary associations as well that he, that he pulls in. But the high lawns, which as I said to you are not particularly high because Cambridge is flat, but the sense that they were on the mountain together, the mount where the muses reside, the mount where the poets frequent the company of the muses, uh, inclining towards heaven. But he only does that in order to talk about how far he has fallen then. But oh, the heavy change. Now thou art gone. Now thou art gone and never must return. Thee, shepherd, thee, the woods and desert caves with wild time and the gadding vine o'ergrown and all their echoes mourn. The willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen, fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays as killing as the canker to the rose, or taint worm to the weanling herds that graze, or frost to flowers that their gay, lands, ward, their gay wardrobe wear. When first the white thorn blows, such licit us thy loss to shepherd's ear. 
So he directly addresses him. Uh, it's a, it's a, an apostrophe, an aside, and he speaks to the presence of Lysidas, even though he's absent, as if he were present. Again, a typical convention. At the, at the loss of somebody, you speak to them directly. Even do this at funerals. It happens occasionally at funerals. It's quite powerful if somebody knows how to speak, if that were possible in our day that somebody would know how, that how to actually understand the con context and so forth. You speak to the person absent as if they were present on behalf of everyone who's there because we're commemorating the loss of somebody who we dearly love to be present with and he's not there and we wish we could speak to him. Well, now I'm going to address him directly on behalf of everyone. Again, it's part of the convention of, an ec of, a, uh, of a pastoral eclogue. And um, references to, to death and signs of entropy in the natural world. The woods, the caves, the wild thyme, the gadding vine or grown, all of these things are signs of, uh, of loss. Likewise, the canker to the rose, so the way that roses are subject to disease. Uh, the worms to the weanling herds, so a, a, a worm like uh, that you get from eating something like a worm, a parasite, or, or a frost to the flowers, all these things that, are, that blight life, these are all signs of the loss of thee in nature. So there's a whole natural mourning of the loss of Lycidas that is sort of a pathetic fallacy in the same way that he expressed it in the Nativity Ode. The whole of nature is, is signposting or uh, betokening the loss of this shepherd. So everything in chorus saying the same thing. And then he begins and he comes to a uh, convention, again, a rhetorical convention typical of the genre, the so-called ubi sunt, where are the, um, the, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, the king of the Golden Hall, Theoden, says, where is the horse and the rider? Where, and he imagines the days, the better days, when we were not in a situation where such tragedy has been visited upon a king and his men. Where is the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that blows? Same thing. Imagining not just the presence of the person who is no longer with us, but also the good days when such things didn't happen. So dark are the days now. So there he is. Where, are, where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep closed or the head of your loved licit us? For neither were ye playing on the steep where your old bards, the famous druids lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona High, nor yet where Deva springs her wizard stream. I me, I fondly dream had ye been there, for what could that have done? What could the muse herself, that Orpheus bore the muse herself, for her enchanting son whom universal nature did lament, when by the rout that made the hideous roar, his gory visage down the stream was sent, down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore. So he invokes the, their presence there and then remarks upon the futility of wishing them to be there anyway. What could they have done to stop death? In the pagan context, they couldn't even stop the loss of their favored singer, Orpheus. Remember the one who bore his wife from the realm of Pluto, from the realm of the dead. Um, and uh, the uh, reference here to Orpheus being torn apart by the Maenads, the followers of Bacchus, for his pains. Not only could he not save his wife, remember he t I mentioned he, he turns back and uh, his wife goes back to the underworld and uh, this is seen as a, a sign of, uh, of the fall, but in the spring she comes forward and then each season dies. There's a sign of this, this is part of the the imagery associated with Orpheus, um, they couldn't stop death. So the pagan muses, the pagan uh, gods and goddesses, that is the, uh, the, the, um, the nymphs, 
and the dryads and so forth, they couldn't do anything anyway. So what's the point of that? This is all a way of building up to who could have done something about that. Not the deities or sub-deities or nymphs uh, associated with the pagan world, but the god of gods, the one who's the lord of life. That would be So he's building to that. Oh, this is futile. This is hopeless. This is a, and he's, at this, he's in the wailing phase of the poem. Alas! Pardon me. Sorry if I just move this over. Alas! What boots it? What does it matter? With incessant care to tend the homely slighted shepherd's trade and strictly meditate the thankless muse. What's the point in that? Again, this is emotionally appropriate again. It's part of the grieving phase. You go through anger, you through, go through denial. He's already thrown aside denial. I'm not gonna, I'm just skipped right over the denial phase. Now it comes the questioning, why does this happen? And at the end of the day, a sort of depression sets in. What does it even matter then? Were it not better done as others used to sport with Amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of Nera's hair? Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, that last infirmity of noble mind. What is the last infirmity of noble mind? Fame. There's something of nobility in fame. The ancient pagans sought it with all their power, the best of them, Achilles, Odysseus, Aeneas, the fame that would come from doing great things and being sung of afterwards. But he calls it the last infirmity that is weakness of noble mind. And he means genuinely noble. He praises it. And yet f fame is nothing in the face of death. And again, in the... Uh, in the Odyssey, fascinatingly to me, Achilles himself says this to Odysseus. He's going to praise Odysse Achilles for his deeds, and Achilles says, I would rather have lived a long life as a slave than to be here. For all the fame, the use of fame is to me. So even, even the pagan uh, Homer is announcing the futility of the life of fame upon which the whole polis of the Greek, ancient Greek state is built. Milton sees it through Christian eyes, of course. The last infirmity of noble mind. To scorn delights and live laborious days, but the fair guerdon when we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze comes the blind fury. The guerdon is a uh, reward. When we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze, the blaze of fame comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin spun life. Now, he's thinking here of the fates and the furies that are going to cut short a life. All of the promise of fame, all the glory set before us, and bang. And he's connecting this again to the story of Christ, who for the glory set before him, scorn the shame, bore the form of a man, was humbled unto death, and then was raised to life. But it was a shameful path, a via dolorosa, not the via um, uh, gloriae. He didn't seek the path of glory. He sought the path of suffering and shame and humiliation. He denied himself. Not the, but not the praise, Phoebus replied. Let's see if I can. And touch my trembling ears. Phoebus is the Apollo or the sun god. And touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in the glistering foil. Foil here, thinking of like tinsel, aluminum foil, it reflects the light. 
set off the world. Now a foil we recognize from theatrical as a convention to, again, be a, uh, a contrast. But here it reflects the light, using it in that sense. Nor in broad rumor lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove as he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame in heaven expect thy meed. So now he, he's still using pagan language of Jove is referring to God. It's a poetic convention. He's not actually invoking Jupiter in whom he does not believe at all. It, it's a way of substituting through classical language references to God the Father. And Phoebus, probably a reference to Christ, the light of the world. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil. How, where, does, where does true honor lie? Where is true fame to be found? Obviously in the path blazed by Christ himself. As he, and, and, and where is it? It lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove. Remember, Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. In that context, that will be the point of judgment. It's not for mortals. It's were you clothed in me? Did you confess faith in Christ? Because it's not your deeds that are going to be praised to you. It's your uh, commitment to my deeds. It's the, it's the uh, imputed righteousness of Christ. It's not what you did, it's the faith that you professed in the one who did great deeds for you. That will be your merits. Lives and spreads the law by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jehovah, as he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame in heaven expect thy meed. Of that, not of your own. O fountain Erethus, And thou honored flood, smooth sliding Mincius, crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher mood. But now my oat proceeds. Uh, oat, a pastoral song, as an oath. And listens to the herald of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves and asked the felon winds what hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain? Swain is a shepherd. And question every gust of rugged wings that blows from off each beaked promontory. They knew not of his story, and sage Hippotades their answer brings, that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm, and on the level brine sleek panoply with all her sisters played. It was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark that sung so low that sacred head of thine. So it wasn't a natural disaster. There was no, it was allegedly, it allegedly happened on calm seas. It capsized. There was something in the nature or the building of the uh, boat itself that brought it about. It wasn't Neptune. It wasn't like in the pagan epics where the gods are roused to bring calamity upon the, uh, the sailors of the day. Hippotades, the god of the winds. It wasn't, wasn't the wind or the waves. Remember that passage in scripture, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? probably has that in mind here. It refers to the waves, refers to the winds, not those. It was something there. But note he doesn't blame God for this. God has not brought this about, but there's something in this which is um, in the fatal and perfidious bark that is in the boat itself. A bark is a, uh, the material from which a ship is built, reference to the ship itself. 
So having said that, he, so he goes from the ocean or the sea, the herald of the sea, and now he comes to, the, to Camus. Now the Cam is the river that winds through Cambridge. When I say a river, you would be shocked at how narrow this river is. It's not as wide as this room. Or in a few places it is, but for the most part it, it, it's very narrow and deep. So it's not anything like a large river. It is a small river. It's not the River Thames. And he's associating with this uh, the, the gods associated with rivers and places. So Camus, he gets, so he gives it a name. He personifies it. Next, Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, that is moving along slowly, his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge, dry, inwrought with figures dim, and on the edge light, uh, like to that sanguine flower inscribed with woe. The, hy the hyacinth, the child, or the, the boy who was killed by the god Apollo, and the blood uh, red from his head, uh, the flower took up that, so a hyacinth has the blood red associations. Inscribe with woe. Allah, ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge. Last came and last did go the pilot of the Galilean lake. Reference to Peter. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain. The golden opes, the iron shuts amain. So he's got the keys. One opens the gates of heaven, the other opens the gates of hell. He shook his mitered locks and stern bespake. How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, and now of such as for their belly's sake creep and intrude and climb into the fold. So this is Peter himself lamenting what the clergy do in his stead. And the, the description here is of thieves and robbers that come into the sheepfold. They're not shepherds, they are the wolves. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest. Because they want to feed. Again, this is, I, I mentioned the uh, communion in uh, Catholic practice in the, in the Middle Ages, the clergy would take the communion and they would not give it to the congregation. It would be done on their behalf, whatever, representative and so forth, but they were not actually given uh, part of that. It's my understanding. And um, a sense of the elect then being the priests and uh, a sort of a, a sanctity, a special sanctity, even a, a sort of election connected to that which is uh, kept from the congregation. The congregation there does not even understand the Latin mass, the words that they're hearing. Now, in reference to them, blind mouths. Now, this is a, an odd um, connection of adjectives. Uh, mouths are not seeing or blind but their mouths are the part of them that is hungry and devouring, and yet they're described, the, the people are described as blindness. So these two associations, the mouths of, of eating connected with the blindness of their lack of vision or sight of Christ himself. Blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook or have learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are sped. They've got what they want. And when they list their lean and flashy songs, great on the scrannel pipes of wretched straw, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed, but swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw, wrought inwardly and foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace and little set, but that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more. Reference to the corrupt, the uh, judgment and punishment of the corrupted clergy. 
Again, this is Milton takes the conventions of the, of the uh, pastoral eclogue and applies the political religious connotations, which again are characteristic of the genre. It appears like a pastoral poem, and of course it is, but it also has political implications, which it always does. Also, even in Virgil and in um, the uh, eclogues of the Greeks as well. Theocritus and likewise. It always has a political, social, and to a lesser extent, uh, religious connotation. So Milton takes it there. Comments or questions thus far? But he's going to talk about drowning and he's going to come back to this multiple times. So he talks about it and each time he does it, um, there's a, a, a reference to um, the death and life of Christ and water being a sort of a form of baptism. So he first uh, speaks of death in line 50 to 63. Where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep closed or the head of your loved Lysidas? 50. But that carries on all the way to line 63. Then he come, picks it up again at 85. O fountain Erethus and thou honored flood, smooth sliding Minkius, crowned with vocal reeds. Again, a reference to the water. And then comes a third time, return Alpheus, Alpheus, here in line. The dread voice is past that shrunk thy streams. Uh, each time he does, life seems a little bit better. So he, the grieving process is um, allowing the consolation to rise out of it. It's almost like, it's like waves of water. It comes over, it covers, it kills, life comes out of it again and again and again. So he comes at it three times. Um, Aquinas argues that baptism is a ritual of drowning, three immersions. And in the Eastern church, they actually dunk you three times. I don't think that's standard in the Western church at all. We die to the old Adam, we rise to Christ. It's a, it's a symbol of being born anew. So you go down under the waves, you're dead to your old self, up you come. And uh, something of the, that ritualistic and religious significance is associated here with the drowning, that's what I'm submitting to you. Okay, well then, to this, return Alpheus. So this is the third reference to a sort of drowning. Return Alpheus, the dread voice is past, that shrunk thy seams, streams. Return, Sicilian muse. And call the veils. And bid them hither cast their bells, and flowerets of a thousand hues. Uh, the Sicilian muse is a, probably a reference to Theocritus and the pastoral idyll of the uh, Greek poet there. So rather than um, elegy, we'll move to a more happy landscape. And that rather than the places where the water is, let's go to the valleys. Bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low, think about the, he, before he was on the mountains with the muses, plates, places of exalted vision, and yet there he only saw loss and sorrow and lament. Now he goes to the low places, the valleys. And think of this even in terms of biblical language and how the valleys will be lifted up and the mountains brought low. And that's to some degree, he's echoing this in, it, in the strains of his own poem. He moves from the heights, even though, as I say, in reference to Cambridge, there are no heights, but imagining that, uh, the place of poetry, but that poetry, of course, is vanity. It goes nowhere. It promo promotes earthly mortal fame, of which is no use. Then let's go to the valleys. Ye valleys low where the, wa where the mild whispers use. Uh, let me come over here. 
where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks on whose fresh lap the swart star, black star, sparely looks. Throw hither all your quaint enameled eyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto and pale gasamine, the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet, the glowing violet, the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine, with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head and every flower that sad embroidery wears. So reference to all manner of uh, a floral landscape now. There's a blooming going on here. It's, it's spring, signs of spring. The flowers have come out. The pink is a type of flower, it's not the color. Bid aramanthus, amaranthus rather, um, and a suggestion here in the footnote, a a amaranthus a reference to uh, Michael, not sure, but big amaranthus, all his beauty shed and daffodils fill their cups with tears to strew, strew the laureate hearse where licid lies. For so to interpose a little ease, let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise, I me, while thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, Where'er thy bones are hurled, oops, whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world, because the body of, he dies in the Irish Sea, the Irish Sea goes up north to the Hebrides in the north of Scotland. Where's the body now? Who knows? They haven't found the body. The body's somewhere at the bottom. It's been lost in the sea where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world. Or whether thou to our moist vows denied sleeps by the fable of Belarus old. Cornwall. Down, so did he go north up to the Hebrides? Did he go down south to Cornwall? The, the west, southwest most, westernmost tip of England. Up there or down there? where the vision of the great guarded mount looks towards Namachus Namic and Bayona's hold. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with Ruth, and O ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Uh, in the legend that the, the dolphins carry up a youth by the name of Arion, who was born on Lesbos. And, and rescue a dead body who then be, is transformed into a sea god. So maybe uh, bring a, a sign of resurrection. Again, Milton, like many of the poets of this day, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien uh, will be included under this, see ancient mythology as a sort of um, prophetic in its, its, its sense of the importance of the resurrection in these myths. There, there's all sorts of myths about dying and coming to life. And they will see these not as true happenstances, but of the importance of resurrection. Even the pagans are pointing to this. They, they do it as a myth. And yet this is a true myth. Christianity is a true myth. That will be Tolkien's explanation to Lewis. And Lewis finds this powerful because he sees regularly this desire in the pagan poets for these things to happen which he also believes uh, must be true. And so now he comes to the cons consolation in the poem. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more. For Lysidas, your sorrow is not dead. Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor, so sinks the day star in the ocean bed. And yet anon repairs his drooping head and tricks his beams and with new spangled ore flames in the forehead of the morning sky. So Lysidas sunk low, but mounted high through the dear might of him that walked the waves. 
Christ. Where other groves and other streams, along with nectar pure his oozy locks, he laves and hears the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdoms meek of joy and love. There entertain him all the saints above in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing and singing in their glory move and wipe the tears forever from his eyes. Right? And the revelation at the end uh, in the, uh, the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more sorrow or pain or death or dying. Their tears will be wiped from their eyes. And now, Lycidas, the shepherds weep no more. Henceforth thou art the genius of the shore in thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood. Thus sang the uncouth swain, reference to himself now, to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals gray. He touched the tender stops of various quills. He's like a like a song. Like you think about the uh, in a in a in a pipe or a flute. There are stops to make the various sounds. He touched the tender stops of various quills with eager thought, warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last. He rose and twitched his mantle blue. Tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. And he concludes the pastoral eclogue with this note not only of consolation but of triumph, victory. Recompense for a life lost. The poems that he never wrote, the life that he never lived, he will nonetheless have all of those things imputed to him by virtue of his faith in Christ and his victory at the cross. His imputed righteousness will be imputed to elicit us. That's what he's leaning on here. Not the things he didn't do because he most certainly did not do them, but they did, those didn't matter anyway. He had faith in the one whose actions uh, would count and did count for him, hence that. And as I say, he takes the the pastoral eclogue then, and, and Christianizes it in light of the consolations of the resurrection. As I said, this is the last poem in the collection of Milton's poems that comes out in 1645. Lycidas is in the company of David, the psalmist, and also Virgil, the writer of Eclogues. And the Lord is his shepherd, just as he was for David. So the shepherd here has a greater shepherd in whose mighty company he is now uh, not only not ashamed to dwell, but rejoices. That's how it ends. Extraordinary poem. And again, fuses classical allusions with Christian uh, themes that baptize them, as it were, and redirect them. Just like Augustine says, um, Christians ought to towards culture in general. Take what, take the things that were were good of this world, devoted to pagan deities, and repurpose them for the good of the kingdom. That's what Milton is doing here. It's a model of Christ in culture. Oh, by the way, the muse of elegiac poetry is Euterpe, E U T E R P E. Saw that at the top of my page. I should have read it out to you. The questions that he asks early on cannot be answered. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? He doesn't seek to answer them. These are unanswerable questions from the perspective of here and now. It's unclear why Edward King died. They are answerable insofar as all things happen in accordance with God's good and perfect will. And there is an answer in heaven. And the answer is that he lives with his Savior in Abraham's bosom.
Comments or questions here? I'm not going to take two classes on it. I just did it in one. We'll find other places here. It's enough. It's a great poem. It's terrific. It's rich. It ranges all over the place. The associations are magnificent. It's mature. You can see how it holds together. It, it progresses. Uh, it, it doesn't drag. I mean, the associations are so rich, it's a little bit dense and hard. But once you start seeing the contours of it, it, it makes sense, the associations. And it, it moves towards, uh, as I say, a Christian meditation on, on death. And the vehicle usually used for lament. No questions. Okay, well, I'll stop this.